Hi friends, happy Friday. I come to you from this very exciting white wall situation here because it is very, very hot in Chicago and I am not gonna turn my window unit off. So I will just close the door and deal with this white wall. Hopefully it's not too obnoxious and too, I don't know, we'll see what it looks like. But uh, the window unit has to stay on. It just, it has to. So it is Friday. It's time to talk about a book. And today that book is Bitter by Aleke Amesi. This is the prequel to Pet, which it falls somewhere in between middle grade and young adult. I would argue that this one feels more young adult. And I find that very exciting and interesting for a lot of reasons, but was a stellar, fantastic book. So let's talk about it. So if you've read Pet, you are familiar with these characters in some way, and it's been a long time, by which I mean two years, so hyperbole, since I read Pet, but I at least could kind of recognize especially our protagonist, Bitter, and her boyfriend, Aloe, that we know a little bit more about in relation to Pet, and then like their friends. But if you haven't read Pet or don't remember Pet, super well. I think that you are going to not have any issues in accessing this, but it is a very interesting conversation between the two books if you have read them both. So I think you can start with either book for sure. It's just very interesting kind of what the trajectory is of the narrative depending on which book you start with. And what I mean by with that is that Pet is looking and exploring a utopia with hidden monsters and Bitter is dealing with a dystopia with hidden heroes. So we are looking at the world that led up to Pet. This is the height of the revolution that we hear referenced in Pet that led to this utopia. And so of course this world echoes and reflects our own world a little bit more closely. And in some ways that can make it a harder read because in Pet, as hard as it could be, it was this idea that we had achieved the thing and that the thing was possible and that even within a utopia, when we achieve the thing, we still have to be on the lookout for monsters and that we can't get complacent. And here we're rather mired in the fear of not having built that yet and not feeling like that is possible. And it opens on that idea and really articulates it right out of the gate. Bitter is an artist and she is not interested in being a tool of the revolution. She is interested in safety and her art and her friends and she doesn't understand why it is being asked of her and her peers to really fight for this world that she feels like is unattainable, that the power structures are working against them and there is also a lot of fear wrapped up in that. And so I found it really interesting because right out of the gate, it pushes against the kind of popular trope in YA of the chosen one, right? This idea that the teens are going to be the ones to save the world. And I like that trope. I think that that trope rings true, especially when you were a young adult, when you were a young reader, you want to feel like there is some control that you can have, that these power structures as bitter articulates that seem totally out of your control, that maybe you can change them, maybe you can have an impact, maybe you can save the world, and you want to see people like you doing that. And this idea also that there is a lot less cynicism when you're a teen and when you're a youth and you believe you can change the world. Not everyone, clearly, because here we have a character that feels like all of the odds are stacked against her, which is also extremely, extremely valid. And I think Amezi does this so beautifully and skillfully in their writing is that they can take all of these different perspectives and treat them and approach them with such empathy. And we can see as readers, I can see as a reader, exactly where that character is coming from. And it makes total sense. I see exactly why Bitter doesn't want to be a part of this revolution. And I see exactly why Aloe feels like he has to help as a medic or Alex, one of their other friends, feels so tied to this group, this idea of fighting for something bigger and better. But I think that the way that this is articulated in the opening both sets the tone really well of the kind of landscape of the book emotionally. It is a great pull in because it plays against that type. And it also establishes the kind of writing we're looking at with this book, which is kind of throughout. If you liked the writing 
in the ogress and the orphans, you're definitely, I think, going to respond really well to this as well. So just to read, get a little taste, Bitter had no interest in the revolution. She was 17, and she thought it was ridiculous that adults wanted young people to be the ones saving the world, as if her generation was the one that had broken everything in the first place. It wasn't her business. She was supposed to have had a childhood, a whole world waiting for her when she grew up, but instead kids her age were the ones on the front lines, the ones turned into martyrs and symbols that the adults praised publicly but never listened to because their greed was always louder and it was easier to perform solidarity than to actually do the things needed for change. It didn't matter. None of it fucking mattered. And I think right out the gate, one that packs a punch, it sets really high emotional stakes, and I think it also speaks to readers in the moment that we are at. And I think that setting those emotional stakes is important because this is a shorter book. I've been seeing a lot of discourse online about the idea of wanting more short YA, more concise YA, and no judgment to a long YA, but that there are so many young people, young readers, the market for these books that are intimidated by a large book or don't want to commit to a large book. And I think that there is a power in having a story like this that is so succinct. But because it's so succinct, the stakes are going to be high right out the gate. And they definitely are. We're in this world in turmoil and our characters are in emotional turmoil. And so if you read Pet, you know that there are monsters that enter this world. And we talk about these monsters as allegory and actuality. So Bitter is an artist who, through the course of the narrative, is able to bring her creations to life with a little bit of blood because there is a physical cost to this. So it is a world that feels very real and grounded, but also feels a little bit not. There is this element of supernatural. There is this heightened nature. It still feels it being Lucille, the city this is in, still feels a little bit bigger, even though it is also very much closer to our actual reality that it is in pet when we see it decades later or a decade later, you know, time passed later. I don't remember how old Jam is at the beginning of Pet. But Bitter reaches a tipping point emotionally where she brings this monster into the world and she is angry and she wants vengeance. She wants the world to be righted. She wants the safety, the protection, the future that she was promised in a world where that is being robbed by greedy people and institutions and thus enters the angels, which are monstrous in a way in and of themselves. They are larger than life. They bring vengeance and terror. And even though these are called angels, there's not a real sense of either religion or mythology in relation to the angels beyond that idea of terror. And I like that it taps on that power and terror of angels as we can think of them. This idea that these are creatures outside of normal interaction and consequence, and so they are seeking a cleansing, a way to start over. And Bitter is like, oh no, what did I do? And I think that that is the moment that really also sets this narrative apart in a lot of ways, because so often we see these kind of chosen one narratives, because in a way, Bitter becomes a chosen one of a sorts, whether she wants to or not. And it's easy to kind of like burn it all down, right? This idea of burning down and starting over. And we get a little bit of that consequently. But the moment that Bitter recognizes that this is born of her anger, her fear, a lot of those messier emotions, she's like, no, I didn't want destruction and death, even of people that I don't like and have caused me pain and suffering and others pain and suffering. That's not who I want to be and what I want to bring into the world. And I think that's super powerful. And I think it goes back to the empathy that is thread throughout this book. There is compassion for Bitter, both when she's angry, when she doesn't want to be any part of this revolutionary group, when she gets anxious and has a panic attack and isn't even able to go to a protest for her friends there is a compassion there. And even the people of that group are compassionate to her. They are like, you know, everyone has different roles here. We're not expecting everyone to be on the front lines of this, of putting themselves in danger, putting their body in danger for this. And it's also compassionate to those 
who give into their anger a little bit, who maybe respond to that potential for violence and retribution that is offered and say, yes, we do kind of want to see the world burn a little bit. And there's some humanness that it is given in when being faced with the actuality of what that looks like, there being more horror, but also there's some compassion in that being a conflict for these characters or some of these characters. This idea that they have been in pain for so long that there is a lot of anger that is manifesting in different ways. And this is all underscored beautifully by the voice of the piece. It can border on didactic at times, but it never felt that way to me in a similar way to the Kelly Barnhill. And I think it's because both are pulling on similar tones and voices and ways of storytelling in that, like I said, everything feels a little bit heightened, right? It feels a little bit like a story of another place, even though it's very much our place, it's almost fairy tale esque in that it feels like just one, one jump over from reality. But it all very much feels like that passage I read earlier. And even when feeling like a modern day fairy tale in some ways, and especially because fairy tales traditionally are much more violent than, you know, the versions we get when we're younger, there is a real sense and gravity to life here and the importance of life. And I think I touched on that briefly in terms of Bitter's reaction to what she has brought into the world. And I think that importance of life and that focus and the compassion, as I've mentioned, are both articulated so well because of the voice and the tone of the piece, for sure. And I think part of that compassion too is that at the heart of this, it is a book about communities, both the community they live in, the community they want to live in, and the communities they're building to reach that dream that we see realized in Pet. I also find it interesting because while I talk about the tone having the potential to feel a little didactic, again, I don't think it does, but I could see where people could make that argument. I think it's interesting because while it can be a little on the nose in places, other things are just very subtle, you know, analogies that just live without comment on the page in terms of like Bitter and her ability to bring this manifestation, this monster, this angel, whatever we want to call it, to life through her art and this idea of the power of art. And I'm sure we could unpack that much, much further as we could just about anything in this book. This same with Pet, I think are genius and pack so much into such little space, offer so much opportunity for discussion and dialogue and thought and reflection and, you know, all of the synonyms. But one thing I said when I read Pet that I stand by and would take to this as well is that I would love to read it, discuss it in some kind of like Socratic seminar type environment. Like I can just imagine talking about these books in an English class and I think that they would be such great vehicles for discussion. I think that they would meet readers and students where they're at at the moment while offering like all of the really good English things to dig into within a novel to discuss. And one of those things being the power of art and the symbolism of that. And in this case, it's kind of twofold. We see the power of art to reshape the world, but also the responsibility of that, how a creation can take on a life beyond what you imagined. And I think it's powerful both in the idea of art being able to reshape worlds. And I also think that there is a power in watching a creative through Bitter reclaim that creation when it is changing the world in ways that doesn't align with the creative, with Bitter's vision of what she wants the world to be and what she hoped this would do. And that brings us back to the compassion again too, because it's this idea that you can make a mistake in moments of passion in anger and extreme emotion, and that can still be rectified. It's not saying there won't be consequences, and it also explores the consequences of those moments, but it looks at it in a really fully rounded way, in a way that the world around us, the kind of dystopia of it all, isn't something we have to dwell on as readers. It's kind of assumed. It gives us just enough details. It doesn't make us dwell in that too long as readers, which I really appreciate. We get to see 
the emotional repercussions of this world for our characters. We get to see them fighting, we get to see them active and fighting for the better world, but also like kind of having this battle of worldviews, this kind of grappling with how you want to position yourself in the world, what you want of the world. We see that especially with Bitter at the beginning where she's like, I don't want any part of this revolutionary business. But that's not necessarily how her friends view things. So again, it's just a lot to explore and unpack in a little bit of space. So I could probably keep babbling about this, but I'm going to cut it short. I would be really interested to hear your thoughts. If you have thoughts about this one, if you've read it, I encourage you to read it if you haven't, because like I said, there is a lot to dig into, a lot to mine from this in just a little bit of space. And if you haven't read Pet yet either, I would definitely, definitely recommend that as well. So yeah, if you want to have a Socratic seminar in the comments, feel free to leave your thoughts. Either way, thanks for hanging out, read something good, and yeah.